Hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is Dan Kams and I'm a postdoc working in the Scalable Solvers Group. I'm working with my PI, Ulan Beme, on problems in quantum computing. Our approach is to leverage techniques and ideas from the field of numerical linear algebra to help us tackle some of the difficult challenges in quantum computing. Today I will be talking about a paper that we recently published as part of Rul's LDRD project. Our work concerns the quantum circuit synthesis problem. And in this talk, I will discuss how we solve this problem using block encodings. The field of quantum computing will have to overcome a variety of challenges to come to full fruition. We can identify challenges in three different domains. First, the development of quantum hardware is a major technological, technological challenge. Second, the analysis and discovery of novel quantum algorithms is an important theoretical challenge. And finally, the development of the software stack to access and manipulate quantum hardware in a programmable fashion is important as well. All these three challenges depend on each other. Technical breakthroughs on the hardware side will allow us to test quantum algorithms, verify our theoretical insights that we have developed about them, and without a doubt also lead to new and improved quantum algorithms. After all, the best classical algorithms were only discovered after the introduction of classical computers and when people could test heuristics and ideas on a larger scale. On the other hand, finding new and exciting algorithms also motivate efforts on the hardware side as well. The promise of quantum computers is that they have the potential to speed up some computational problems and solve them faster than their classical counterparts can. One of the most interesting applications out there where we achieve a speed up over the best known classical algorithms are quantum simulations in chemistry. In this talk, however, I will focus on one of the challenges in quantum computing that uh, is called circuit synthesis. The method that we use to solve this problem leverages some concepts from tensor decomposition techniques and uses the notion of block encodings. To start off, I will now proceed to introduce a few peculiarities about the qubit model. A single qubit is a model for a two-level quantum system. In this model, we have two orthonormal basis states, which we denote with cat0 and cat1 with this bracket notation that is shown on the slide. These basis states are the quantum analog of the 0 and 1 state of a classical bit. We can map them to the columns of the 2x2 two two identity matrix as shown on the slide. However, a qubit can be in infinitely many more states besides the two computational base states, and this is fundamentally, fundamentally different from how a classical computer works. It can be in any probably normalized superposition of cat0 and cat1. The squares of the amplitudes of the superposition, alpha and beta, are the probabilities for the respective outcomes after a measurement. The block sphere picture, which is also shown on the slide, is commonly used to represent the state of a single qubit system. On the block sphere, the orthogonal cat0 and cat1 states are located at respectively the north and the south pole of the sphere. Any, qubit state, any single qubit state cat psi corresponds to a point on the block sphere, and it is parameterized by two angles theta and phi. We can say that the state of a single qubit lives in a two-dimensional normalized complex vector space, or a two-dimensional Hilbert space. When we move over to n qubits, it becomes even more involved. The computational basis states are now tensor products of the cat0 and cat1 state of the single qubit model. For example, the all zero basis state now maps to the tensor product of n times the 2x2 two two identity matrix as shown on the first row on the right hand side. This vector is equal to the first column of the identity matrix of size 2 to the n. This principle extends to all other computational basis states, and they are 2 to the n in total. This corresponds to the dimension of the Hilbert space that describes the state of, a quantum, of the quantum system of n qubits. And the state space is thus of dimension that is exponential in the number of qubits. Similar to the one qubit case, the state of an n qubit system can be in a superposition of many or all basis states. An additional feature of an n qubit state is that it can be an entangled state, which means that the state of the quantum system can't be fully described 
by the states of the individual qubits, but we have to consider them as a whole. Now that we understand some properties of state spaces of qubits, we need to know how we can manipulate the state of a qubit system in order to perform a computation with qubits. A model that we use for this is that of a unitary transformation acting on the qubits and the model of a quantum circuit diagram. In this simple quantum circuit diagram, pictorially show how a unitary matrix, which is the box labeled UN in the middle of the slide, acts on n qubits on the left side and transforms their input state to an output state on the right side of the diagram. The underlying operation is just a linear transformation or a matrix vector product carried out on the input state vector. The matrix UN is required to be a unitary matrix in order to preserve the proper normalization of the amplitudes throughout the quantum algorithm. And just like the Hilbert space, it is a matrix of exponential dimension 2 to the n. However, there is still a problem here. The quantum computer cannot perform such a global transformation acting on all qubits simultaneously. Instead, we will have to synthesize the unitary into smaller local operations acting on one, two, or at most just a few qubits. This step is the quantum circuit synthesis problems that we want to solve. In this quantum circuit representation, the unitary blocks are also called quantum gates. Quantum gates that are stacked vertically in one layer are concatenated via the tensor product. And the different layers that are stacked horizontally are combined through matrix products. Quantum algorithms are only of particular interest if they can be efficiently synthesized. This means that the number of locally interacting gates scales sub-exponentially in the number of qubits, as otherwise the asymptotic scaling of the quantum algorithms become too large to be feasible and to expect the speed up. For general unitaries, however, an exact synthesis typically requires exponentially many gates. This slide reviews a few of the synthesis algorithms that have been proposed in the literature. In the class of algebraic techniques, the most efficient algorithm that is generally applicable is the, based on the cosine sine decomposition of a unitary matrix. The KAK decomposition is related to the cosine sine decomposition, but is specific for the two qubit case. It requires three entangling sinon gates and is known to be optimal. Methods based on QR factorization have also been proposed, but these have worse asymptotic scaling than the cosine sine decomposition method. All algebraic techniques have as a disadvantage that they scale exponential in gate complexity, but they are, are universal and can synthesize any unitary up to arbitrary precision. In recent years, optimization-based algorithms have been proven successful in overcoming the scaling issue for many applications of interest. Of particular interest is QFAST, which is a synthesis algorithm developed here at Berkeley Lab by Ed Yunus and Kostinyanku. All these methods still have as a common factor that they rewrite the large unitary matrix into a product of unitaries that are acting locally on a subset of qubits. On the other hand, repeat until success techniques allow for a non-unitary approximation scheme, but they have so far been limited to the synthesis of single qubit gates. In this work, we will cherry pick some advantages from these other methods. We will impose a certain algebraic structure on the unitary that we can optimize for but that requ requires non-unitary transformations. The algebraic structure that we use is that of a tensor rank decomposition, which is also known as a canon canonical polyadic decomposition. In this context, a tensor is a high dimensional, dimensional array. In the picture, we show a third order tensor, which is a 3D array that is approximated as a sum of R rank one tensors. Third order rank one tensors are the outer product of three vectors. This, this type of decomposition have been, has been widely used in applications in numerical linear algebra, scientific computing and data analysis. One advantage that they have is that they are essentially unique under mild conditions. Another one is that good optimization algorithms have been proposed to compute the tensor rank decomposition approximately. One of these algorithms is the alternating, alternating least squares method. Although an exact solution to this problem is an NP-hard problem in general. One of the challenges that we will face in using this structure for syn circuit synthesis purposes is the following. 
assume that the tensor x corresponds in some sense to a unitary transformation. It is clear that in that case, the rank 1 tensors will not necessarily correspond to unitary matrices. Furthermore, we will also need to figure out how to implement the sum of rank 1 tensors in a quantum circuit. In our approach, we compute the approx approximate tensor rank decomposition of a unitary acting on some qubits. The first step in the process is to tensorize our unitary and to transform it from a matrix representation into an equivalent tensor representation. In practice, this operation is just a re-indexing of the matrix elements and requires no actual computation. The order of the tensor it is equal to the number of qubits the unitary acts on. Every mode or dimension of the tensor is of size 4. In the figure shown on the slide, we show the tensor representation for the 1, 2, and 3 qubit case, which corresponds respectively to a first order tensor or a vector, a second order tensor or a matrix, and a third order tensor or a 3D array. I'll continue explaining the rest of the, of the method for the 3 qubit example or the third order tensor. After we have reshuffled our unitary matrix to a tensor representation, we can compute a tensor rank decomposition from this tensor using existing methods. This approximates the 3D array as a sum of rank 1 tensors. The following step in the process is then to go from a tensor representation of a rank 1 tensor back to a matrix representation. We call this step in the process matricizing the tensor. And we see that the result of matricizing a third order rank 1 tensor is a Kronecker product of, two by two, of three 2x2 two two matrices. Again, this step is just a simple re-indexing of the elements of the tensor and doesn't require any actual computations. Combining these three steps, we see that we have deduced a scheme to decompose our original unitary as a sum of matrices that have a Kronecker product structure. As mentioned previously, while the original matrix is unitary, this is no longer valid for each of the 2x2 two two matrices in the decomposition that we have computed. We can identify kind of a quantum circuit representation with this decomposition that we have computed. On the left side, we have our original unitary acting globally on all qubits simultaneously. This unitary is rewritten as a sum of layers that are composed of tensor products of 2x2 two two matrices on the right side. There are two issues with the circuit on the right side that prevent it from being a valid quantum circuit for now. The first issue is that all gates labeled M are not unitary and hence they do not correspond to valid quantum gates that preserve the amplitudes of a quantum state. The second issue is that we only know how to compute products of matrices in quantum circuits but not yet how to compute sums. To solve our first issue of unitariness, we introduce the notion of a block encoding to relax the unitary constraints. In a block encoding, we embed a non-unitary matrix M in the upper left block of a larger unitary matrix U. This might require a subnormalization of M to spectral norm less than or equal to 1. To accommodate for the larger unitary U, we require more qubits to implement it compared to M. These additional qubits are also called Anshala qubits. The qubits to which our matrix M is actually applied are called the signal qubits. If this larger unitary U is applied to an input state that is initialized to zero on the Anshala qubits and to some desired input state get psi s on the signal qubits, the output state is a properly normalized quantum state proportional to m times psi s if the, if the Anshala qubits after application of U are measured in the zero state. This is what the meter symbol in the circuit represents. Because we depend on the outcome of the measurement on the Anshala qubits, the application of a block encoding is probabilistic in nature. This issue can be mitigated through a subroutine called amplitude amplification. Now, now that we have solved the issue of non-unitariness, we still have to tackle the second issue of the linear combination required in the tensor decomposition. But first, we show how we can eff effectively and efficiently concatenate block encodings into tensor product a step that is also required to finish up the algorithm. For quantum gates, this is really easy. We just have to concatenate them on different qubits and then the tensor product follows naturally because of the structure in the problem. 
For blo block encodings, it is slightly more involved, but still relatively easy. Assume that we have some circuit U1 that block encodes a matrix M1. And not only that, but assume further that we have n quantum circuits U1 up to Un that block encode the matrices M1 to Mn. Our goal is to combine these quantum circuits such that they block encode the Kronecker product of M1 up to Mn. This can be done with a simple and efficient quantum circuit construction that just combines the different block encodings and prepends and upends them with some swap gates. The swap gates are, are indicated by the crosses connected through the vertical lines, and as their name suggests, they are swap the state of two qubits. The swap gates require only a minor overhead in gate complexity and can be considered efficient. The result of this circuit construction is a larger unitary that block encodes the Kronecker product of M1 up to Mn in its upper left corner as desired. To overcome our final issue with the sums in the tensor rank decomposition, we introduce a circuit construction to compute linear combinations of block encodings. Suppose we are given the following expression, for which we want to compute a quantum circuit that block encodes it. We don't have to start from scratch, but assume that we are given quantum circuits that block encode M1 up to Mn, and a quantum circuit that implements a unitary Q with its first column induced by the coefficients y of the linear combination. These circuit elements can be inserted in a larger quantum circuit with the following structure. This circuit block encodes the linear combination. The exact details of the circuit construction are not that important for this presentation, but it introduces a few additional Anshela qubits, and it is important to highlight that this can be done efficiently in terms of gate complexity if m scales sub exponentially and if every individual block encoding quantum circuit UI has an efficient gate complexity. It is clear that combining all the previous steps in the correct order, namely starting from the unitary, tensorize it, decompose the tensor, matricize it, and then circuitize it, we arrive at a method that constructs a circuit which block encodes a matrix with a tensor rank structure as shown on the slide. This circuit construction is efficient under some mild assumptions. Specifically, the tensor rank shouldn't grow too large and the individual bug encodings should be small enough or have a bounded gate complexity. Let's move over to an example to test our method on. One of the examples that we have studied the synthesis problem for is the XYZ Heisenberg Hamiltonian model. This is a model for the magnetization in certain spin systems consisting of S spins. The Hamiltonian naturally has a tensor rank of 3 times s minus 1. The exact tensor rank is encircled in black on the figure on the right. However, for our purposes, we treat it as a dense matrix, tensorize it, and then decompose the tensor in rank 1 terms. The figure on the right side shows the approximation accuracy and function of the tensor rank for different system sizes ranging from 3 to 6 pins. We observe that the numerical tensor rank decomposition approximate, approximates the model up to 8 digits of accuracy when we use the exact rank. When we try to compress the tensor rank, the relative error increases rapidly, but still a reasonable approximation can be obtained with a reduced rank. Compressing the rank leads to shallower circuits, which utilize fewer quantum gates. Localized Hamiltonians, such as this Heisenberg model, per perfectly fit in the format that we have proposed in this presentation. To conclude, in this talk, we have shown that block encodings are a versatile, versatile tool in, in circuit synthesis, as they can be efficiently combined through tensor products and linear combinations. These results show that low-rank tensor decompositions lead to efficient quantum circuits that have good scaling properties and overcome some of the issues with other algorithms. Many interesting problems naturally have low rank tensor structure so that, such that our technique is expected to be widely ap applicable. We discussed an example of a localized Hamiltonian for the Heisenberg model. Another example are discretized differential operators. They fit the format perfectly as well. With that, I would like to conclude my talk. I would like to thank you for your attention and open up the virtual floor to questions.